Cari spettatori, eh, buongiorno. Oggi sono all'Istituto di Scienza e Ingegneria Molecolare per un'intervista veramente speciale. Come sapete, quest'anno il Nobel per la Chimica è stato dato a tre scienziati per la loro ricerca sulle macchine supramolecolari. E oggi sono qui con il professor Jean-Pierre Sauvage, che è, è stato così gentile da dedicarmi un po' del suo tempo per una breve intervista. Buongiorno professore. Buongiorno. Buongiorno a tutti. E, e... Ma il mio italiano è miserabile, allora <ride> penso che sarà meglio di fare l'interview in inglese. Certamente. Sì. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with uh, Professor Sauvage. Professor Sauvage è a really uh, amazing career. So now it's emeritus professor here at the University of Strasbourg and it's member of the French Academy of Science. And from uh, the last week it's a Nobel laureate in chemistry. So I want to start just with the most basic question. Can you very shortly explain us yeah. your, your work, your research? My research, you mean the, the philosophy of the research? Uh, what, what, uh, what you did for getting this uh, Nobel Prize? Well, You know, I, I worked hard, you know. <laughs> um, I think the, the most important was um, um, several, you know, we tackled uh, several problems, mm -hmm. research problems in molecular sciences, uh, generally speaking. And um, we also changed topic um, many times, you know, uh, we didn't stick to one very well defined topic. And uh, at some stage, uh, we had the feeling that one of the very new topic we were investigating, which was on dynamic molecules, molecules which can move, which can be set in motion, um, that was a very important field and uh, also very novel uh, with um, uh, limited work from the past. Okay. So, uh Obviously, in, in these days, a lot of journalists have prepared their articles, have brought about your research. Yeah, sure. Do yeah. You, have you noticed some mistakes, some misconceptions <laughs> about what they, they, they told about your yeah. work? Something yes. that you w absolutely want to clarify. Yeah. Now, I want to clarify that uh, um, we have done basic research, basic science. And I think it's a very general problem, you know, when you, you are interviewed by journalists or when they write something on your work, uh, they put the emphasis on applications. And I think there is, if I may say, you know, there is quite a large distance between basic science and applications. Okay. And how, how important so it is today to do still basic research, very often also the the funding from European Union or You're in right. general, they are uh, all they always ask for some practical application in view. You're right. And how, why it's so important so to invest time, money and efforts on basic science? Sure, you. that's a very good question. The answer is also very simple. Everything comes from basic research. All the technologies we are using, you know, in our everyday life, Uh, be it I with uh, computers or in uh, medicine, everything comes from science. So science is at the origin, so fundamental research is thus at the origin, and then uh, te technological uh, applications come. Okay, I, I perfectly agree with you. Now, uh, for a scientist, it's very important also to find the good person, especially at the beginning of our career, to uh, that let us and make us grow as as a scientist. Who yeah. was the, the scientist that influenced you the most? Uh, you mean um, before we started, really? Uh, uh, it's very difficult to tell, you know. Uh, well, I studied with Jean-Marie Lane, but uh, of course, I mean, he had a very, very strong influence on me, uh, mostly for the way of tackling problems. Also, uh, uh, in the way he used to manage his research team, 
you know, very, very close to the people in his group, and I try to do the same, naturally. Um, but scientifically, he also had, uh, you know, a big impact. But probably um, another important thing was uh, when I was a postdoc in England, uh, in Oxford, um, I met uh, Malcolm Green, who was, he was my boss, he was my um, supervisor when I was a postdoc, and I learned with him transition metals, you know, transition metal chemistry, inorganic chemistry, organometallic chemistry, and I think that had a very big impact as well for the future of my research. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you don't know, but Professor Sroage was a PhD student from Jean-Marie Lenn group, and Jean-Marie Lenn is uh, one other uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Supermolecular Chemistry, and he, he also works uh, here in uh, the Institute of Science and Engineering Supermolecular, and we have also a third Nobel Prize, that is Martin Karpus. Now, um, so, from the start of your career, yeah. uh, how is changing chemistry and science in general? Well, wow, that's a very difficult <laughs> question. You know, I started my career, I mean, I became independent, completely independent, in 1979. So at a relatively young age, you know, when I was 34, 35. And um, I should say that uh, funding was easier to obtain. It was not terribly easy, you know, it was not, uh, you know, you, you had to make an effort in the way you present your research proposals, your research projects. But I think it was easier, no doubt, than today. Okay. Also, I think that just chemistry perhaps a big change in today. Chemistry is related to almost every other um, subject. So uh, as a chemist, we have to work with uh, medical doctor, with the engineer, with physicist. We have some new uh, files that are completely interdisciplinary, I think about, for example, nanotechnology. Yeah. Uh, do you think that for the general public, this uh, new chemistry has been understood or for people, the, the chemist is still just the person playing with test tube and so on? Well, I think for the public, you know, for the general public, the image they have is really blurred. I mean, it's not clear at all. Uh, but if I may say, you know, on the first part of your question, uh, even, you know, several decades ag ago, uh, science was very multidisciplinary. What has really changed is, for chemists mostly, the introduction of new techniques, you know, very heavy equipments, which are absolutely mandatory, and um, all the, the techniques, all the you know, the way you analyze, you know, your molecules or the problems, you know, uh, so and this has been a, a big, big change. Okay. Yeah. How much do you think it is important for a scientist to be involved also in communication with uh, the general yeah, public? That's, that's a good point. It is very important. You know, most of the time, I mean, what we do in our laboratories uh, is paid for by the, the taxpayer and uh, the general population. I think they deserve you know, some, uh, um, some um, information you know, about uh, what has been done with the money they have given to scientists. And I think it is also very important that they realize you know, that um, some discoveries can be very important. Of course, some others are less important. But it is indeed extremely important to communicate. Okay. Uh, how it's possible to be a high-profile scientist and still find the way to have a personal life, a family, and so on? <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's very difficult, especially for young, young scientists. Very often they propose you the, the subject, like, if you are a scientist, then you have to uh, lose something from your personal life. How do you think it's possible to, uh, yeah. to find something? Yeah, to some people say that when you enter in science, it's like entering in religion. Um, I think I completely disagree with that. Uh, I had a normal life. I get along very, very well with my wife. Uh, we had a son. We got along extremely well with our son. 
We had um, every summer we had three weeks of vacation. Um, no, that was, I mean, I used to work on Saturday most of the time, but never on Sunday. And uh, no, I think I had a very pleasant and uh, normal life from a private viewpoint. Okay, thank you very much. Now, the last question, perhaps yeah. the most difficult one. Yeah, please. I just started my career. I'm just yeah. a second year PhD student. What is your best advice for me? Uh, for you, uh, I should say, you know, you should build up your own culture. And I think, uh, you know, during your PhD thesis, this is certainly the very best moment with your postdoc, when you do one or two years of postdoc uh, afterward. It is the best moment to read, you know, uh, really to read, you know, uh, as much as you can. Uh, even to read in fields which are not your own research field. Um, and, you know, what you will build up, you know, in, in your, uh, let's say, cultural uh, package, um, you will keep it for many, many years. I think the, the five first years of your research life, of your, you know, the, the beginning of your life as a scientist, uh, they are extremely important. So try to learn as much as you can. Uh, even if you are in first or second year of your PhD thesis, um, take a sheet of paper and a pen and write some you know, possible project, an extension of something you have read, you know, which will give you an idea. Even if the idea is not clear, you know, try to clarify you know, the pot potential projects. And I think from the very beginning, you should really ask yourself the question, uh, shall I be able to design projects, you know, to, um, yeah, to be adventurous by myself? Okay. So, uh, let's say thank you to Professor Sauvage for okay. being here with me. Thank you for this, uh, this uh, interview and obviously good luck for <laughs> Thank everything. you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.